Good afternoon and welcome to the SMU Video Archive Series. Mars Terry, who is E.A. Lilly Professor of English, uh, is here with me. I'm Jim Brooks. I'm former Provost, Provost, now Provost Emeritus of the University. And we're here to continue the conversations that we've been having about the university during the 50s, 60s, and now 70s. Uh, Marsh, last time we pretty well covered the first part of the 70s with uh, a fairly exhaustive discussion of Paul Hardin's uh, appointment, his accomplishments, and his departure. Yes. And we were, I think, about to the Tate Interregnum that followed Paul's uh, leaving the presidency. Um, the, that was in May of 74, and at that time, my recollection says that uh, Willis Tate, who had continued as chancellor of the university during Paul's presidency, was in Mexico, on Puerto Vallarta, uh, relaxing when he got a phone call from board chairman Ed Cox, summoning him back to head the university uh, in the chief administrative position uh, while a new president was, was sought. And you remember those days very well. I, sh I sure do, and I remember that uh, uh, Willis seemed uh, a little off balance at the beginning of that. Yes, he, he did. I think uh, I, w I was, of course, provost then, and um, Willis uh, came back, and even though he had been officing just down the hall from Paul Hardin and was ostensibly in the middle of uh, the activities on the administrative floor of Perkins, uh, he really was remarkably out of touch, and understandably so. And uh, so it was a very uh, um, interesting maneuver that all of us had to carry out to let him really ultimately make the decisions that only the president or the chief executive can make, but at the same time uh, to help him make those decisions uh, and shore up uh, his uh, his information base and his knowledge uh, while while we were working through those problems. Reminded me of an old football player coming off the bench, you know, he's gonna come off and make a big play, but he wasn't sure what the signal was. That That's a pretty good analogy. Uh, one of the, uh, of course, one of the things that, one of many things that happened that spring, Tom Martin in, I think, April, March or April had given us his resignation as dean uh, to be effective um, almost immediately in order for him to assume the presidency of the Illinois Institute of Technology. And so we were dealing with uh, an acting dean there, Leon Cooper, and uh, so it was, a, it was a very interesting time because uh, Willis was not so much aware, but those of us uh, who had been in the trenches during the first part of that decade were very much aware of the fact that we were running budget deficits and that we needed to get a grip on this. Um, and that, we began talking almost immediately with Willis about the need for this kind of institutional planning. And of course this was, a, this was something that he was really uh, at least not focused on, if aware of at all. And that was uh, that was very interesting. The last, last big big plan had been uh, 62, 63. That's right. The, so the master plan. Ten years later. Right. Um, was uh, do you think this is kind of the end of the era of the so-called racehorse deans? They started to peel away. I think it was the beginning of the end of that era, and it it came to focus rather quickly in the in the year and 15 months that or 15 month year and three months that Willis was, was in the president's office. Um, one of the interesting things was that, uh, of course, it's, as, as we both know, it's customary for the president of the university to give a, a state of the university address at the opening faculty meeting uh, in the fall semester. And Willis asked me if I would prepare that address for the faculty. Uh, and that was really the point at which we began to talk publicly about 
uh, developing an institutional plan that would evaluate programs, uh, review budget, and help us make some hard decisions that we very apparently were going to need to make. But coming along in that same period, touching on the racehorse deans, um, uh, Bob Lyle, Bobby Lyle, who had uh, been the executive dean of the business school and really ran the business school uh, during the time that Jack Grayson was in Washington uh, heading up Nixon's plan commission. Mm -hmm. uh, when Grayson came back, uh, Lyle really effectively continued to run the school and Grayson uh, was present but was, did not reinsert himself in the, in the active administration. And towards the end of that year, in May of 75, I believe, uh, Bobby Lyle resigned in order to go do a, a doctor of education at Amherst at the, uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, shortly thereafter, Jack Grayson came in and wanted to resign. But I, by this time, Paul had been terminated and uh, I persuaded Grayson to stay on. We had enough confusion without uh, having another dean resign and he graciously agreed to stay on uh, uh, until uh, we were through that, that crisis. What was going on in, uh, in the college? Was it the School of Humanities and Sciences then? Or? It was still the School of Humanities and Sciences. Uh, it was uh, uh, the change to Dedman College, or the college really didn't come along until uh, a little bit later and really associated with a common educational experience, I think. Yeah, that was uh, one of our ideas, that we would create a college at the center of everything and that right. maybe somebody would endow it. <laughs> 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 worked out okay. <laughs> worked out okay. It took a little while, but it worked out fine. Um, but one of the, one of the uh, other turbulent things that happened, and as I was reflecting on all of this, you know, we were very spoiled. There was a lot going on in the 50s and 60s, but in comparison with the 70s, those were really very stable periods in the history of the university. And if you look at the 70s and 80s, uh, uh, there was a lot of turbulence. Uh, of course, when, when uh, I moved into the provost's office with Paul, uh, we had at, uh, at interim administrations in the uh, in the college, what is now the college, and uh, we were recruiting a dean, and that's when Lee McAllister came yeah. aboard as as dean. And I, I imagine you remember, I certainly do. Uh, Willis asked him to uh, give an opening convocation address uh, that fall. Oh for, yes, I remember that. I'd forgotten that. Was that when he talked about W. Worthy Sterling University? That's right. That's exactly right. Sterling University and uh, all of the professional schools, uh, gr undergraduate professional schools, were very concerned about what implications this might have for their futures because they had been uh, kind of in, the, in a pivotal role in the, in the decade preceding. So, um, we got through that year uh, with Willis, but it was it was a, an arduous year. And uh, Marsh, I'm as I'm remembering, uh, there was a essentially a, a trustee search committee with some faculty representatives uh, to find a new president to find Paul's successor, and they worked mightily for over a year to accomplish this. I don't remember who was on the on that. Uh, I had been on the search committee for Hardin. I don't remember who, what faculty were on the search committee. Uh, I think among others was Barbara Reagan, but I'm not uh -huh. absolutely sure of that. Um, of course, our friend Johnny Marie Grimes, who whom, about whom we've spoken in some of our earlier conversations, executive assistant to the president, and she was sort of a house mother to the university in a very real sense, and she was, uh, I don't know what her title was, but she was very heavily involved <laughs> <She> <laughs> was. In, in that search committee. 
Well, I, my, re my reflection is that the 70s was a very vital decade in my life, and I had moved back over into the English department, was chairing the English department uh, two times, and uh, went to Spain and directed the program there. And so you were and there and in got 72? involved with Taos. Yes. Uh, teaching there in the summer with your help and support. And uh, so I, I w that was the main spectrum, but uh, I did get uh, seduced or commanded back into planning by you <laughs> <laughs> uh, a, a, li a little later. Yeah. Lee McAllister uh, came in and uh, he had been an SMU graduate. Lee was an SMU graduate, that's right, and, but a uh, business school graduate, interestingly enough. And he, and he came as a distinguished geologist from Yale. That's right. And uh, made an impact. Yeah, Lee was he wasn't the, kidding about Sterling University. No, he came here with the idea of making uh, the School of Humanities and Sciences the pivotal point in the university, just as Yale College was in Yale University. And uh, he worked very mightily at that cha that task, and we helped him as much as we could. And that's what we picked up on in the uh, Terry Commission a little later on. Uh, yeah, Lee, uh, just an aside, Lee was at that time, and this may have changed now, but at that time he was the youngest person ever to be appointed full professor on the Yale faculty in the history oh, really? of the university, yes. I, at a very young age, because he was a very bright, um, articulate, able guy working on interesting and exciting new ideas, and it was recognized with the faculty there. I saw him this morning on the parking lot. He somehow has grown a white beard. That's right. <laughs> he claims that it's because his wife likes it. <laughs> Amazing how that happens, isn't it? It is. It is indeed. <laughs> well, back to... Uh, to the search for the president, um, my recollection is that there, there were three principal candidates that were brought in uh, for on-site interviews. Uh, and it's kind of interesting because all three were recruited out of major state universities. None of them at that point came out of a private university. Mm -hmm. And we were looking for somebody to build a great private university in Dallas. Uh, that probably is, uh, has no significance, but it is a point of interest. The first one that I remember uh, was Frank Rhodes, who was at that time Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Michigan. And um, he subsequently, he, I think he withdrew from the search here, my recollection is, that he did that, but not too long after that, he was named president of Cornell University and really just retired within the last few years, having had a very distinguished mm -hmm. career at Cornell. So uh, that was uh, that's a regret that he didn't uh, come here, but uh, uh, there were others in the wings. And do you remember a guy named Singletary? Otis Singletary, I do, yes. He, he came in and uh, hung around and Seemed quite pleased to be here. I think he uh, was a Texan, wasn't he? Yes, I believe he was. He made noises about uh, possibly returning to his home grounds and all of that. Uh, but all from Kentucky University. From Kentucky, you know, president of the University of Kentucky, um, and I guess ultimately he withdrew, uh, and that led us to. Uh, he disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> he he <laughs> fell off the stage. Um, but that led us to Jim Zumberg, who had been president of Grand Valley College in, in uh, Michigan, then dean of the School of Mining and Earth Sciences, or something close to that, at the University of Arizona, and then chancellor of the, the uh, University of Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, uh, courtship took two or three months, as I recall. Um, one of the interesting episodes uh, in the recruitment, of course, he was brought here, I think, at least twice on a somewhat clandestine basis. And uh, 
he was very interested in seeing the de Gaudier estate, which the university then owned, it having been given to us as part of the settlement of that estate. And um, he wanted to go out and see it, and I was one of the few people that knew who he was and knew that he was here even. And I took him out there on one Sunday morning, and uh, he wanted to look in the house, and I thought the house was probably locked, but I tried a door and uh, it opened and we walked in and all of a sudden we were surrounded by Dallas police and, and uh, university <laughs> security people. We had inadvertently triggered the alarm system and he was quite alarmed because he was, was here on a clandestine <laughs> basis and we'd blown his cover. Oh, my. But uh, uh, that led then to, I think he arrived, my recollection is the fall of 75, about maybe October of 75, is that about right? I believe so, yeah. Uh, an interesting figure. Uh, he was a, a very cool dude. He was indeed. In both senses of the word. And uh, I remember going in to meet him, as I've said before, and uh, he was very formal. Got up and buttoned his coat and went over and stood behind his desk and said, what can I do for you? <laughs> I'd kind of grown up with presidents in that office, and I kind of said, not much, I guess. <laughs> um, so he seemed to be off-putting, and you, you, you have the sense of this because you worked with him and knew his M.O., but uh, I think there's a case to be made that um, Lee and Tate were strategic presidents as Turner is a strategic president but that uh, Zumberg was one of the best presidents in terms of academic sense yeah. and uh, knowledge of the structure of academe and, and uh, working with his staff and so on. Well, I think, I think you're right, Marsh. Um, Jim was certainly uh, an aloof person and the closer, uh, it was my observation, and really he confirmed this in, in an indirect way, that the closer you were to him in terms of administrative responsibility, the more aloof he was from you on a personal basis. And uh, he once said to me, I don't want to let anybody too close to me, it's too hard to make decisions, which is diff a different style than many presidents have, but nonetheless it was his and, and uh, it was important to learn to work with it. Um, he, he, uh, he was a, a remarkable guy, and when, you, when he did let his hair down, he was really a lot of fun. Um, he was the first person in his family, he had grown up in Minneapolis, and he was the first person in his family, I believe, to have graduated from college. And he went on then again at the University of Minnesota and did a PhD in geology, and had a very distinguished career in geology as a, uh, uh, well, on a number of things, but best known, I think, probably for his work in Antarctic geology. And he was head of the Antarctic Commission of the National Science Foundation. And Is it true that he had a cape name for him? He had a cape name for him in, uh, in Antarctica. And uh, spent even when he was in the president's office, he made, I believe, at least two trips there uh, under the aegis of the NSF, National Science Foundation. So he was... Uh, uh, he was a very, I think you, you put your finger on it, his academic instincts and values and knowledge of what a, what a university, how a university uh, should work and what a real university was really all about, I think uh, I cannot think of another president with the possible exception of Humphrey Lee that had that kind of academic instincts. Um. Why would a guy like that uh, want to be a university president? I think it was another mountain to climb. And Jim was an achiever. He'd, he'd climbed one mountain after another coming up uh, through, um, from, from uh, a, a growing up environment that, that uh, didn't uh, insert him in higher education, and here was another set of things that he could try to achieve. I think it was, I think he was an achiever, and that was simply one more thing to do. 
I remember when he slipped away from SMU, he said, uh, SMU is a sleek cruiser, but I'm going to go head of captain a big battleship or That's something right. like that. That's right. That's right. Yet another challenge. That's right. Uh, I was going to mention one other thing about Jim. Uh, I had occasion uh, uh, to be with him. Well, actually, our wives were with us, and there was, uh, this was uh, in Colorado Springs, and we were at a, uh, the closest thing that uh, I know in this country to an English pub. And Jim, uh, there was a piano player, and uh, we were enjoying our beer, and Jim, uh, the piano player, uh, had been playing quite a while, and Jim began to stir around and eventually took his beer and went over and started talking to the piano player. And in a minute, uh, the player took a break, and Jim got up and got in on the stool, and he played the rest of the evening. <laughs> and he does not, did not know how to read music. He played totally by ear, but he had an enormous uh, repertoire of, of, of cabaret, cabaret songs. And uh, it turned out, I found out later, that he worked his way through graduate school playing in oh bars my. in Minneapolis. <laughs> I remember one night at Sandro Comini's, he sat down at the piano and did uh, Roll Out the Barrel. That's right. <laughs> no, he, there was that facet about him, and, and uh, I think all in all, uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're going to look back and, and say that, that this university owes Jim a lot. I have to tell the, 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 the story again of it when he first addressed the faculty and said he was not indulging in hyperbole when he said that SMU <laughs> was going to be a fine university. We tried to persuade him <laughs> that it was not hyperbole and wondered what kind of a bowl that was that we are going to be playing in, and he, he, he stuck to it. It was hyperbole to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it took uh, all of us males, I think, were about half scared to tackle him on, on something like that, and uh, no, although we tried, and it took one of our f female faculty colleagues, I think, to finally persuade him that he should at least look in the dictionary <laughs> for the correct pronunciation. <laughs> um, what was his philosophy, Jim, for uh, when he came in for SMU? What did he <coughs> think was needed needed to be done? What what Jim really wanted. Uh, and the sleek cruiser metaphor is, is kind of appropriate. He wanted a, a trim, well-formed university um, that had real quality about it and was clearly uh, moving on a path to, toward excellence in education. I think there was no doubt that that's what he wanted. And if you look at the decisions that he made in his five years, uh, they almost all pointed in that direction because he picked up um, very quickly on uh, on the university planning business that we had begun with with Willis and the interregnum, and uh, we went through a period. Uh, in addition to doing a lot of, of the routine things, we went through an evaluation of everything in the university and. Uh, he made some difficult cuts in the non-academic areas. The baseball was cut, golf was cut, uh, a number of things that, that uh, were partly symbolic cuts but were also very real financial cuts. And on the academic side, um, we had in the provost's office, we were evaluating all of the pro academic programs in the university, going back to what we said a moment ago that we really had to find ways to reduce the budget, and what what we were most interested in was to try to really keep strong or build stronger the the, the solid programs, and trim some of the others, uh, and use the money to improve the quality and the basic programs. And this was a philosophy that that really came from. Uh, person named Fred Terman, who had been provost at Stanford when Wally Sterling was president there, and the two of them had built Stanford from a good regional college to a great university. 
by selecting steeples of excellence and hmm. building, appointing strong people and building strong programs, realizing that 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 strength would pull the whole university up. And we were embarked on trying to do the same thing here. And as a result of that, uh, we, we looked at programs in terms of whether they duplicated uh, similar programs at nearby universities, whether they were solid in terms of quality, uh, what it would cost to, to make them a really strong program. And we, as a result, eliminated, I think, 14 programs, academic programs, including a good deal of the, uh, the undergraduate education programs, which yes. have been reinstated. Because at that point, if you looked at the demography, uh, you could see very clearly that whereas when those programs were really strong, they were represented one of the two or possibly three career paths for women students. Uh, but by the time the 70s came along, there were women in law school, women in engineering, women in the business school, women in, in medicine, and it was, the trend was moving in that direction. And the enrollments in undergraduate uh, education were dropping dramatically. So we simply uh, reduced those programs. Plus the public universities doing that. That's right. That's gone up and down and back and forth. I heard the other day they might be considering a small school of education here. Really? Well, Isn't that they're looking at the numbers and I'm not. <laughs> so, well, I was going to mention uh, some other things that were going on then um, in that period. <laughs> uh, I mentioned uh, that Grayson had, Jack Grayson had agreed to stay on as dean uh, through the turbulent period, and so shortly after Zumberg came aboard, um, Grayson came in and said he really thought it was time for him to leave, and we didn't resist him on that. We felt that he was ready to move, and we were through the worst of the turbulence, and, uh, but that left, since uh, Bobby Lyle had left, we then uh, made Alan Coleman Dean and he did uh, an exceptionally good job. It was a splendid choice because uh, in the college, in the liberal arts, uh, people respected Alan Coleman. He was a liberally educated person. That's right. He was uh, a book man. Very much a book man and, a, and a, an art man. Mm -hmm. Collected paintings. And, uh, it was very interesting. He had uh, he actually came out of an undergraduate liberal arts college and had all of his uh, business experience at the graduate level, MBA and then a, a doctorate from Harvard, I believe. So he was, uh, he, he was the kind of uh, dean that, that helped all across the university because he played a role. Um, we had two or three dean searches going on in the last part of that decade and I think Alan, if, if he wasn't chair of all of the search committees, he was chair of at least two of the three. <laughs> Jim, is it true that uh, when, when he arrived, uh, that Z Zumberg uh, asked for the, re the resignations of the vice president? Uh, he did, uh, and um, <clears throat> he called me in. He came, I believe, in October, and in January, he asked me to come in and visit, and he said that I was going to have to be his confidant. Um, and he told me what he wanted to do, uh, and he really felt, and certainly was the prerogative of a president, although at that time it was not as common as it may be now for a new president to uh, want a whole slate of his people, a new slate. But he also uh, recognized the fact that there were maybe uh, more vice presidents than we needed. Uh, there were five, vi when he came, there were five vice presidents plus the provost, plus an executive assistant to the president, at least one. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so... There'll be a meeting of the vice presidents in Moody Coliseum. That's right, you got it. <laughs> and uh, there was nothing, they were all good people, but they didn't fit Zumberg's style and his expectations. And so he asked for the resignations of all of the vice presidents 
and one of the executive assistants. And uh, maybe by that time, the only executive assistant. I think some of the others had left when Willis retired. Johnny Marie, for example, had left. And uh, so we ended up with a new executive assistant, John Stevens, and uh, three vice presidents. I had stayed on as provost. Uh, why I was spared, I'm not entirely sure, but I was. There must be a reason. <laughs> uh, well, I think he lost his nerve when he got to me. <laughs> but uh, we had uh, uh, a brand new vice president for student affairs who had been um, uh, had been in a student-related uh, appointment at Cornell, and uh, that was Walt Snickenberger. He came in as vice mm -hmm. president for student affairs, and uh, Don Smith came in as vice president for university relations and development, uh, or whatever the irrelevant title is, and Hoyt Kenimer came in as vice right. president and treasurer, and uh, John Stevens, I mentioned, came in as executive assistant to the president. It was a new cast, and, and uh, they were really a very good bunch to work with. I, I, mean, I, uh, I liked them all, and, and they had good values, too. Smith was getting ready for a campaign. Was he the first really professional development person? He was the first really professional development person that we had had, that had been through campaigns and knew how to organize them and so on. And that was uh, all of this planning and program reshaping and so on uh, was in, in our thinking, was leading to a campaign that would probably be launched in, in around 1979-80. But we had to have the ship in order before we did it. That was Zumberg's metaphor and his philosophy. For a Marine, he, uh, he had a lot of nautical metaphors. <laughs> um. I, uh, he asked me to chair a committee on the uh, undergraduate curriculum and the uh, university college, which had kind of withered away by then. That's right. Here again, it had been more than 10 years and uh, needed to see whether to keep it. And I remember he said uh, he, he loves stuff like that. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's right. That was the theme I, for a commencement address. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I said, it's broke. <laughs> and uh, he named a committee of, of uh, including myself, seven full professors. And we met for a year. Well, that was a blue ribbon committee. Well, it was a lovely experience. Uh, Who all was on that committee? Lloyd Fouch and uh, Lorne Howard and uh, Ann Thomas, Tom Williams, Julius Aronofsky, and John Deschner. That well, was that, quite a committee. That was quite a committee. And uh, we met at, uh, in Lloyd Fouch's digs every week for about a year. And uh, we, re we uh, reviewed all the philosophy of the master plan and reaffirmed it and uh, tried to uh, explore how to make the old curriculum of the you know, university college more flexible and came up with uh, core courses and capstone courses and a flexible uh, time scale in, in which to locate uh, uh, different uh, categories, uh, thought and art and so on, and uh, turned it over to faculty committees, which then uh, went to town with it. And uh, we had no trouble getting it through the uh, four undergraduate schools. There was great enthusiasm. That was a high moment. And I remember John Deschner, <coughs> who was, of course, a tremendous asset to the university. And uh, it was just a wonderful thing that uh, such a distinguished theologian would give his time to this. Right. And he and I went to see Zumberg. Zumberg said, sit down at his table. He had a table with the flags, <laughs> Antarctica and the United States, <laughs> right. here, Texas. And um, he, he got a pencil and made sure it was very sharp and said, 
And so this is going to be a common educational experience? And I said, yes, and he wrote common educational experience. <laughs> and having named it, of course, he bought it. Of course. And he pushed it. And yeah. he announced it. That's right. And he backed it very strongly. In fact, there was a meeting in a faculty meeting, a whole university faculty in McFarland Auditorium, where he sold it. He did. He did. So that was that was a very high moment of, of all the stuff I had done at SMU. That was a, 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 a really beautiful philosophical experience with peers. Well, I'm sure it was, and uh, if if well, I were to set out to pick a committee, uh, it'd be hard to improve on that because it was representative uh, of, of all of the parts of the university, and they were all quality people, uh, who none, no one of which was a was a shrinking violet. And I contrast it with uh, in ninety ninety four ninety five revising the curric under the general education patterns again and, and keeping them and reshuffling some. Uh, but that was a committee of 15 or 16 people who were in there to get their share of the pie of the enrollment. <laughs> it was a different kind of an experience. Well, you remember, and I thought one of the, one of the reasons that the, uh, all of the planning and procedures uh, leading up to the what you just described, uh, it was all built around being having the undergraduate faculties of the university and even some of the professional faculties, notably theology and perhaps law, uh, involved. Uh, it was very important to, to making that plan work to have a complete faculty buy-in. And that's why it had to be voted on. Yes. In, and I remember very well sitting in my office waiting for the ballots to be delivered over and of course a couple of jokers and among our faculty colleagues who were the couriers bringing it in came in with long faces and said we don't want you to be upset about this we'll find a way to make well of course they had all passed with with uh, uh, a strong majority <laughs> so uh, and the Terry Commission grew out really out of the, the planning because once the, the programs were reviewed then we knew what you had to work with and you're thinking about resources and, and what could be done and so on and I, I think that was a rather, really a rather grand period in the university's history. And we, you, you and I and, and others, but uh, you and I were certainly in it for the long haul from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, I think we can be proud and secure in that we kept a strong program of general education. And that in the first place, it, uh, it was very important because our student body was so homogeneous. That's right. And, and there were perspectives there that they wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And uh, right now, we have uh, a strong curriculum that... Uh, has an ethics component in many of its uh, perspectives courses, uh, has uh, cultural formations courses, and a lot of interdisciplinary kind yeah. of things. So uh, we, we've, we've kept it, and, and that's, uh, gosh, since 63. Uh, yes. And you know, one of the things that's most, I think, most remarkable about all that is that Doing interdisciplinary stuff in a university uh, teaching is one of the hardest things because there is no reward system typically built in to reward faculty for contributing in that way over any period of time. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a challenge and it's often fun for a faculty, but after two or three years they begin to see that the rewards come for traditional teaching and uh, research in traditional fields. And it is a challenge that I think, I, w I certainly wouldn't say that SMU uh, solved it, but I, th I think we did it about as well as, as any university I know of. I think that's true. Um, while all this was going on, there were uh, 
the usual kinds of um, uh, changes taking place. And uh, Tom Martin resigned uh, just shortly before uh, Paul Hardin left in 74. And we had, um, as I recall, two acting deans. It took a while to fill that deanship. Uh, but it was filled in the early part of Zumberg's um, tenure with the appointment of Carl Willenbrock, uh, who came out of the government and um, uh, was another guy who had kind of a broad liberal arts sort of philosophy about him uh, and personally was a, was a very good colleague with a great sense of humor. but. Carl had acquired uh, too much pleasure out of jet-setting around the world when he was a government servant in Washington, and he never quite got over it. And uh, he uh, ultimately, uh, he wasn't spending enough time here in developing the school. And uh, so he, he left, and that set up another round of, of searches, which Alan Coleman chaired. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, Lee, McAll Lee McAllister returned to teaching. That's right. And uh, the chair of history became dean. Isn't That's that right. Hal Williams, Williams was appointed after, again, uh, and a fairly a, exhaustive process. And was a strong backer of uh, general education. Yes, because he himself had taught in it. And the other thing that, that we did in that Terry Commission report was to suggest that Central College College at the center. Yeah, right. Uh, that that uh, had, had been Lee's idea. And uh, it, it, it's still that way. The, 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 the college, all the students enter the college, and uh, the general education is there, plus the liberal arts and sciences uh, courses. So that structure is the, the same. It, it, it amuses me a little bit that uh, they now call it Deadman College of Humanities and Sciences, <laughs> instead of just Deadman College. Yes. Uh, well, I suppose that's too uh, reinforced, but it would be, uh, it would, I think, uh, from your point of view and from mine, it would be nice to simply call it Deadman College and make the point that it is the center of the university. Exactly. Well, as Willis would say, it, uh, they, they want to clarify it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> or clarify it. <laughs> well, you know, uh, all the while people were um, coming and going, and one of the deans that was certainly would have to be listed as, in my book, as one of the two senior deans, uh, Charlie Galvin, the dean of the School of Law, and he was certainly one of the deans that I leaned on most heavily for a university perspective, uh, decided that he wanted to, to uh, leave the deanship. And he had actually been offered a chair at Vanderbilt University in tax law. Mm -hmm. And so Charlie resigned. And he took that chair, didn't he? And he took the chair and served in it very, uh, with great distinction for a good number of years. And, I'm glad to say that he's now back, uh, back in Dallas, and uh, is uh, associated with with us in various ways. Uh, but his short-term replacement was a dear friend of yours and of mine, A.J. Thomas. A.J. and Ann, when I directed SMU in Madrid in '72, were the faculty. Yeah. They had a great gold Buick, the biggest car in Europe, <laughs> and, and, and two Cocker Spaniels, and Ann's mother. They were really, really wonderful, wonderful people. And uh, A.J. had a voice like this. <laughs> yeah, he was. He spoke Aggie Spanish. <laughs> Aggie Spanish. In Madrid. Espanol. <laughs> and when he was, uh, <laughs> when, when he was, uh, interim dean of the law school, he, he said uh, he'd come in in the morning and there would be 12 people typing away. And they'd type all day. And he'd leave and they'd be typing. 
<laughs> and he didn't know what they were typing. <laughs> <laughs> he hadn't dictated anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, he had a great sense of humor and very solid academic values. And uh, uh, if his health had been stronger, uh, I think he might very well have uh, been considered for the, the uh, continuing deanship. But as it was, uh, one of his colleagues, although a number of people were interviewed, most of them from away, uh, when, uh, Jess Salacuse was appointed, and Jess served very admirably in that deanship for uh, several years before he went to the presidency of uh, Tufts School of International Studies. And another area, uh, the other really strong uh, dean in terms of university strength during during the Zumberg era was Joe Quillian in theology. Yes. And uh, he reached retirement age, and we had a search for him that was headed by Alan Coleman, a search for his successor, I should say. And there were a couple of other retirements uh, or resignations in theology during that period of time that, that I think uh, were acknowledged, but nobody could fully adequately acknowledge what their contributions to the university had been. One was Deckard Turner, who was the the person who had really built Bridwell Library, uh, and he left to head the uh, Humanities Research Center at the University of mm -hmm. Texas in Austin. And uh, he I was one of our best people ever to grace SMU. He was. He was. And I remember uh, shortly after I became provost, Bill Heroy, who was then vice president treasurer, came steaming into my office with a fist of, full of papers. You're going to have to do something about this guy who runs Bridwell Library. And Deckard had been off on a book hunting trip to London and had been buying $100 bottles of wine and other uh, dissip dissipatory activities uh, in uh, in his quest for books, well, he came back with a very valuable set of books, but Bill was stuck on the $100 bottle of wine. <laughs> and, uh, but that was Deckard's style. He knew how to do these things, and he did them superbly. We have uh, the collection of Incanabula that we have because of Deckard, and uh, on and on and on, a collection of Bibles, and so on. I remember him showing me a copy of The City of God. Yes. That was amazing. He not only was that uh, book collector and, and famous uh, at the, here and at the HRC, but uh, he had a great courage. I remember he uh, brought John Howard Griffin over here to speak. John Howard Griffin had written a book, Black Like Me, and he had dyed himself black, mm -hmm. going through that, that experience. and as a result been lynched in effigy in Mansfield, Texas, uh, where, where he lived. Um, Deckard was a, uh, a, a tremendous encourager of, of writing and writers, uh, and me. Uh, he was editor of the Southwest Review for, for a while and accepted my very first story. Did he? Yeah. yeah. Well, I remember one of, uh, when Deckard would get excited about something, he'd go into his office to talk about an idea, and he'd sit up on the edge of his chair, and his eyes would sparkle, and he'd say, now, looky, let's get on with it. <laughs> 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 and he was, uh, I, there's no way of, that we'll ever be able to repay the debt that we owe him, I think, for one of the world's really strong libraries. And the other person in theology uh, with whom, when we've talked about Albert Outler uh, back in the ma our discussion of the master plan, but Al retired during this period and um, continued uh, to edit the Wesley series uh, until he retired and moved to Florida. But he was, uh, he was another person. He, he was certainly one of the handful of people that uh, helped form the, the graduate program in religion which was really designed to, to keep our strong theology faculty that Merriman, Cunningham, and Joe Quillian had created to keep them here because it was, uh, it was not teaching how to preach, it was teaching 
uh, in the study of religion and as a humanity rather than a profession. Well, he was much respected and uh, as we have noted before, he was the one who really wrote that, uh, well you were on that faculty committee of the Master yes. Plan and he wrote that essay. Uh, can, can a church related university be a great university? That's right. And can SMU and the answer was yes if it's committed to um, denominational but not sectarian practices of exploring all truth claims. Right. Well, Albert, uh, uh, and you know, the amazing thing, uh, he viewed himself as a professor of the university, not a professor in the Perkins School of Theology. He viewed everyone as uh, one of his colleagues, uh, and he didn't, I'm sure that he evaluated their work intellectually, but as human beings, everybody was on a level playing field. He treated everyone the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he was a great stimulant, uh, as, as we said in, in our earlier conversations. But his, his departure, uh, while it, it left strong, uh, really towers of strength like Schubert Ogden and John Deschner and Vic Furnish and Joe Allen and others, uh, there was only one Al Outler. And uh, I think it's important to note that well, it would be interesting to to uh, take a look at uh, who uh, who among our people at SMU were nationally or internationally recognized. Yeah, yeah, and he certainly would be yeah. internationally recognized. Yeah. Uh, what was that story about him being a delegate observer of Vatican II? Yeah, he was. That came along right about the same time in the early '60s, and. Uh, he was a delicate observer, uh, one of the few Protestants there, and it is said, maybe apocryphally, maybe in truth, that the Pope would come in to convene the session and look around and say, where's Al? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let, let me move on before we run out of time because some other things happened that I, that I want to uh, signal because um, while they're not in terms of the kinds of things we've been thinking about, talking about, uh, they are not there. They are in terms of the image of the university. I had been concerned for some time about uh, taking advantage in every way we could of making this place seem as much like a real, you know, a real sure enough university to use uh, <laughs> Joe Quillian's terminology as possible. Or maybe that was Claude Evans' terminology. Yeah, Claude Evans <laughs> praying, Lord, make this sure enough university. <laughs> It, but uh, we had a carillon in the tower, have a carillon in the tower of Fondren Science Building that had never been played or very seldom played. And our dear colleague, Lauren Howard, to whom you've already referred uh, as a member of your um, Common Educational Experience Committee, Lauren, in addition to being an electrical engineer, was a, a very accomplished musician. And Lauren agreed to take on and work with the, the School of Music in arranging to have the carillon played uh, several times a day and uh, for longer on special occasions like commencement and so on. And that's still going on today and I think that adds a, a feeling about a campus that, that uh, is special. But the thing that I really want to comment on more uh, honoring Lorne is the what we try to do about the ceremonial occasions at the university, um, particularly commencement, um, when, when before we got started on this, we'd go to Moody Coliseum and here was the scoreboard hanging in the middle of the room and just bare <laughs> bleachers around and a platform that might have a potted palm or two on it and that was about all. And we gradually, as we could find the money to do it, we. Um, uh, we set about to improve that, and one of the things that I did was to find the money to send Lauren to Harvard once or twice to work with the chief marshal there and once to Stanford uh, to see how they did their commencements. And uh, if you look at commencement now with the drapes around the balconies and the seal behind the, the platform and, and an orchestra rather than canned music, 
All of those things are, are uh, mm -hmm. attributable to Lauren Howard, and uh, I think the university is in his debt for, for being able now to project the image of a place that knows what quality is, and I'm, I'm very grateful to Lauren for that. Well, speaking of commencement, um, and this is sort of uh, Sundberg's valedictory, uh, the last commencement he presided over, you will remember, he I gave did. the same speech that he had I given did. at the previous commencement and uh, uh, pretended to have his speech written on three by five index cards and held them up and let them slip out of his hand and down into the orchestra and uh, used that as a basis for ending his talk. <laughs> uh, but it was the morning after that commencement that he met with his official cabinet, the vice presidents and me and the executive assistant, and announced that he was accepting a position as president of the University of Southern California. Uh, but Z was, um, Z was a, uh, I think, as, I, as we said a little bit earlier, we're going to look back, I think, and, and at the things that happened, and particularly uh, the attempts to improve the quality and certainly the attempts to improve the, or to return to a core interdisciplinary curriculum that you headed. We're going to look at that as, uh, I think, one of, the, one of the solid pieces in the university's history. And he was an encourager. Uh, just as Ken Pye was later. That's right. Uh, of the meaning of the church relationship, of the uh, basic curriculum. That's right. And that sort of thing, uh, which uh, ho holds in place now when our emphasis is outward and having to do, with, again, with a great spate of new buildings. That's right. I think I think uh, under uh, Gerald Turner's leadership, a lot of the things that that Jim Zumberg envisioned have actually, after a hiatus of 20 years, uh, have have begun to fall into place. And I think the other thing that that uh, that happened, which uh, is a credit to you, because how many years were you provost? Nine. And that was remarkable. And uh, the, before that, uh, provost hadn't amounted to much. I mean, in terms of what you were provost over, <laughs> over maybe, maybe the college and the, and, the, and the theology school or something like that. But uh, now, now we have a president who can trust a very able provost and that these things hold. Well, thank you for saying that. Uh, it, it seemed awfully important to me to really try to establish uh, you know, little things like, for example, uh, it was uh, the provostship was simply listed as vice president and provost. Uh, we turned it around and called it provost and vice president for academic affairs with the emphasis on provost because Paul Hardin recognized that the provost was um, the first among equals. Uh, as far as the, the people at the vice presidential level. And we added uh, the provost signature on diplomas, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, all those kinds of things that were little things, but... Uh, well, it's big, it's really a big thing when, the, when the, the provost stands for the academic enterprise and there are these other vice presidents. That's right. But it's not that he's just one, one among others, it's that he is the important vice president and he's the number two guy. Um, so I, I, I think that's, that's, that's been established. Well, Marsh, I think we're, I'm getting a signal that we're out of time. It's, I've very much enjoyed these conversations we've had, and uh, I hope that uh, people who may view these tapes down the years uh, find them in informative and, and hopefully interesting. And we may do four more, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank and, you. And uh, uh, thanks to uh, Bill DeRossick and, and all the folks involved with the video archive series. I think that's, a, that's an important piece of university history. 
It is what Mark Twain called the varnished truth. <laughs> there you go. 